uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to have uh, Dhruv uh, from uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, moving to Cambridge University. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, tropical geometry and Hurwitz numbers. All right. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Thanks for coming. This is uh, it's really fun for me to be able to talk about mathematics in, in Chennai because I grew up here and then I left for 10 years. And when I, before I left, I didn't know any mathematics. So someone feels as though I've made progress as, as a human being, which is good. So, um, yeah, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about the tropical geometry of Hurwitz numbers. And, uh, and my hope is that, uh, you know, if, 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 neither if neither of those two sets of words are familiar to you, that's, that's perfectly fine. Uh, because I think they're both interesting subjects, one very old. Uh, and one very new. So, so what, I, what, what I study, I study uh, tropical geometry, which is basically a collection of combinatorial techniques that have been developed in the last, uh, I'd say, 15 years or so uh, that kind of translate problems in algebraic geometry into problems in combinatorics or piecewise linear uh, combinatorics. Uh, but rather than give you an introduction to any of, of those ideas directly, I would like to motivate it using something uh, something much more classical, uh, something much older. Okay, so I'll start with Hurwitz theory, and then I'll, I'll explain a little bit of, of the philosophy of tropical geometry and, and maybe some of the results that it can, uh, it can provide us. Okay, so for Hurwitz theory, this is uh, 19th century mathematics, uh, dating back to, to Hurwitz and Riemann, is essentially the study of meromorphic functions on Riemann surfaces. So, so it studies uh, maps from, uh, from a Riemann surface uh, to uh, the Riemann sphere. Okay. Uh, by the way, I'll make a, I'll make a slightly funny um, convention, which is to always draw my Riemann surfaces when they are not, uh, okay, when, when the Riemann surface is the source of my uh, of my map here, I'll draw it as an actual two-dimensional object, and I'll draw my, my, my P1s as a line. Uh, so you can think of it as some sort of pancake. This is a convention introduced by Andrei Kunkov, who's a field medalist, so I don't need to justify it. Okay. So I'm, I'm interested in studying, uh, studying such maps. So does that, everyone knows what a meromorphic function on a Riemann surface is? Is that okay? Should I recall what a Riemann surface is? Anyone who wants me to recall who, what a Riemann surface is? OK, last chance. No? OK. Great. So we know what a Riemann surface is. It's something that looks like this. It has a complex structure. It makes sense to ask what a, uh, what a complex analytic function is locally. And so when I have a non-constant map um, from a Riemann surface to P1, there are a bunch of facts that, uh, that one knows uh, right off the bat. So these are classical facts. Uh, so pi is a finite map, okay, which is exactly what it sounds like. So the pre-image of, of uh, of every point in the base is a finite collection of points uh, in the source. Uh, in addition, pi is uh, uh, unramified over uh, all but finitely many points. So what I mean by that is that there's some finite collection of, quote, bad points over here, maybe something like this, where if I look at pi inverse of such a point, I don't actually see, okay, so finite of degree d, meaning if I choose a random point here on the base and I look at the pre-image, I get exactly d points. And there's finitely many times on the base that that doesn't happen. Okay, there's finitely many points on the base when I look at the pre-image and I get fewer than d points. So I could take a degree three cover, and, and, and every now and then I'll only see two points in the pre-image, and I call such, uh, when, when such a thing happens on the base, I'll call it a branch point, because the, the map is branching at that point. Uh, and on the source, I'll call those ramification points. Okay? Uh, so, so unramified means that I have the expected number of pre-image. So outside a finite, finite number of points, uh, the map is always unramified. It has a degree d, it's, uh, it's finite. Um, uh, ah, yes, so just to, to, to be clear about this, uh, in particular what that means is that, uh, uh, let's say, pi is a covering space 
uh, for p1 when I remove these points. Okay, so. so there are some, some finite collection of points b1 through bn, and if I remove those points, then I just get a, a topological uh, covering space in the, in the naive sense. Okay. So there's a, there's a famous result in this area, which is uh, Riemann's existence theorem. which I won't state in its, uh, its, in its, uh, in its full generality, uh, but it amounts to the following, which is that once you know this data, there's only a finite amount of additional data that you need to completely reconstruct the map. Okay. So let me explain it uh, as such. Okay, so, so let's take this. So let uh, bi on p1 be uh, sorry, uh, uh, branch point of pi. Okay, so let me draw a picture of that. So I have some. So I have a. Let me just look locally. So I have this uh, this little this this point bi in a little neighborhood around it. Uh, and in the pre-image, what I'm going to see is um, is something like this where above bi I see fewer than the, than the required number of, uh, uh, of pre-images, but nearby bi I actually see all the, all the, all the, the, the full degree d. Okay? So this is pi when I look locally. Okay, so locally pi looks of this form, so in this case the degree is uh, whatever it is, 4 plus 3 is 7. So this is degree 7. And you'll notice there's naturally a piece of combinatorial data floating around over here, which is, uh, you know, so uh, I can ask at every point how many sheets are coming together at that point. So here there are three sheets coming together, here there is, there's one sheet, here there's one sheet, here there's one sheet. And so what I get is a partition of the degree, in this case partitioned into uh, mu, three, one, 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 one. Okay? So maybe I should call this mu i. So mu i is naturally attached uh, to bi. So when you think about the, the geometry in this situation, the following interesting thing happens. So let me label, let, let me label these, uh, these, these pre-images. Okay, so I'll fix a point here and I'll look at the pre-images. I see seven of them. And there's something interesting happens here, which is that if I choose a point and I look at these D pre-images and then I go in a loop and I come back, what I'm getting is an element, well, so this is called the monodromy of this, uh, of this cover, what I get is an element of the symmetric group because it's, there's no guarantee, and in fact, usually it won't happen that if I just go around this loop, the order of the sheets won't change, right? So I could start here and I could go around the loop and I can come back to somewhere else uh, on this, right? So, so in effect, what this gives me uh, is uh, uh, what we like to call a, a representation of SD, uh, sorry, of Actually, let me just do it this way. So I get monodromy data. Of how the branches are permuted. As I go around the loop. Right, so around these around just these special points, I have this extra bit of data, which is as I go around the loop, what happens to the sheets above. Okay, so Riemann's existence theorem tells us that, that this, the data of, of exactly how that happens, the data of, of how, how the sheets get permuted as I go down to every branch point, together with just this topological information, is enough to reconstruct this covering. Okay? And from this you can deduce the following fact, uh, which is um, if we fix the branch points, B1 up to Bn, and we fix everything inside actually. So D, and then mu1 up to mu D, which are, sorry, mu, mu1 up to mu n, which are partitions of D, which are recording the, 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 the nature of the geometry above these, uh, uh, above these points. Then, okay, sorry, and uh, the genus of C 
then there are finitely many covers of P1 satisfying this data. Okay, So there's some basic input, which is the genus, the degree, the ramification information, uh, which is just in the form of these partitions and the locations on the base where you want the ramification to happen. You put all of that together and you get some problem, right? some reconstruction problem from the, fin from the discrete data. How can I construct uh, each of these covers? Uh, and, and from the Riemann existence theorem, it follows uh, that, uh, that, there are only, that there are only finitely many. Okay, so the Hurwitz number, the Hurwitz counting problem is the answer to, 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 to that question. So how many, how many such? So, uh, so definition, uh, the Hurwitz number so this is going to be a number that, that takes a lot of uh, uh, discrete data as input. So it's uh, H for Hurwitz, uh, degree G covers of P1 of, uh, sorry, genus G covers of P1 of degree D with partitions mu1 up to mu n, and then we just understand that I pick endpoints on the base, my, my favorite endpoints on the base to fix where this is happening. Okay? This is a, uh, okay, so this counts the number of uh, degree d uh, genus g uh, covers of uh, p1 with ramification uh, data uh, mu1 up to mu1. Okay? And so this is what I'm interested in. This is my kind of basic, uh, basic building block. Okay, so these, these numbers come up a lot. There's, there's, uh, so so one, one place, one natural way in which it comes up is the following. Uh, so it comes up in a purely representation theoretic uh, uh, standpoint. So the Hurwitz number can be uh, understood as the number of factorizations of the identity in the symmetric group into cycle types that are given by mu1 up to mu n. Okay, so that's a purely combinatorial group theoretic formulation. Uh, so if you, you just take the identity, which has something to do with the fact that we're covering P1. Um, so you take the identity in the, in the symmetric group and you look for different factorizations of the identity into cycles whose cycle types are mu1 up to mu n. That's a purely algebraic way uh, to, to approach the problem. There's, there's a bunch of other ways in which the Hurwitz numbers come up naturally. So these, uh, these range from, you know, uh, uh, op, yeah, so, so vacuum expectations of operators on the Fox space to intersection theory on the moduli space of curves and a bunch of other stuff. Okay, so it's a, it's a rich and, and beautiful subject. Uh, and I want to I want to consider uh, some aspects of it now. Sorry. No, no, no. So the the monodromy data is uh, so this is the yeah. So so the Riemann existence theorem is the statement that the monodromy data determines the cover from which you can deduce this fact that I just said, which is that. The, uh, so I just don't want to write it out in full glory, but the, the, that statement is just that uh, the, number of the number of covers of the Riemann sphere with this input data is equal to the number of factorizations of the identity um, in the symmetric group. And so so that's, that's essentially what is in that statement. Further questions? Yeah. Yes. Uh, it, so that's a, it's a different from the perspective I'm going to take. I'm going to take a more geometric perspective. Uh, so, so yeah. But I'm happy to. Uh, if I do it at the board, I'll, I'll mess it up for sure. So, uh, let me let me cop out of doing that. Okay. So this is this this somewhat mysterious uh, counting problem that we don't really have a good handle of. So understanding. Uh, understanding the Hurwitz numbers, uh, 
in some sense, okay, we, we, we have some recursive formulas for them. You know, if you really wanted, if you gave me a D and an R and a, and a G and you wanted to compute uh, the, uh, if you wanted to compute the, the Hurwitz number with, that, with those parameters, in particular, in, in principle, you could ask a computer to do this, right? But asking a computer to do factorizations in the symmetric group is, is a problem because d factorial is a large number once d gets reasonably large. Okay, so it's not really, so it would be nice to have some structural understanding of this. And so, so because of this, people have, have kind of started, or people often settled for a little bit less than understanding this problem in, uh, in full generality. Uh, and so the, the first case in which, uh, okay, actually, maybe just I'll, I'll introduce uh, the one I'm interested. So, so there's a, there's a, there's a sub, sub problem of this problem, which are, which are called double Hurwitz numbers. Double Hurwitz. So these are Hurwitz numbers, where so this is H G D uh, uh, mu one up to mu n, where um, where the following happens, where mu one and mu two are arbitrary. Okay, you can pick them to be whatever you want, but I'm going to insist on mu three up to mu n are simple. Okay, so simple here means that uh, mu i is equal to 2, 1, 1, 1. Okay, so this is the simplest possible non-trivial partition you could have. Just a word about why one, has to, one, one would do such a thing. Uh, so if you've never seen this before, you should ask yourself, you know, why am I bothering keeping track of this, this uh, um, ramification data at all. So there's a basic topological fact, which is, um, which is that when you have a, a, an unbranched covering of, from one surface onto another, then you can compute the Euler characteristic of the base uh, from the Euler characteristic of the source and the degree of the map. Right? And this is not so hard to think about, right? So if it's an unbranched covering, you just take a triangulation of the base and you take the pre-image and you'll get a triangulation of the source. Now you just do vertices minus edges plus faces, and then you get the Euler character. So there's some basic obstruction to having unramified coverings, which is the Euler characteristic. Right? If the Euler characteristic is wrong, I can't have unram unramified coverings, which means I'm going to have to force some branching. Right? And so the amount of branching that I force is governed by these. And so this, this, the closest you could be to unramified, the closest you could, you could be to having just a covering space, is to have finitely many points with the simplest type. And so, so even before people came to double Hurwitz numbers, which are interesting for reasons that I'll get to, um, people were actually studying simple Hurwitz numbers where every single one is asked to be simple. Every single uh, ramification type is asked to be simple. And even there, there are interesting questions to ask. There are, uh, there are, there are structural properties that, uh, that come out. OK. So before I, I kind of move into the, the tropical geometry side of things, I want to tell you one result that is kind of interesting um, uh, about the structure of, of double Hurwitz numbers. Okay. So in order to do that, let me, uh, let me make the following definition. So I'm ju I just want to pick a, a collection of vectors, uh, maybe Z1 up to Z, uh, X1 up to X capital N. Uh, such that the sum of the Xi's is equal to zero. Okay, so this is just a, an integral vector whose, whose, um, which has vanishing sum. Uh, and what I also want to do is is fix that the what I'll call x plus, which is the sum of just the positive entries. Right, some of these are positive, some of these are negative. So the, just the sum of the positive entries I want to be d, which is also, uh, yeah, just the sum of the negative entries. Okay, so sorry, let me redo this sum of xi positive uh, is d, and naturally that's the same as the sum of xi uh, i negative is equal to d. Okay. 
That's equivalent to the data of, of, of mu1 and mu2, right? Because this is a thing, so you can think of mu1 as being the positive part and mu2 as being the negative part. So this is just a, it's a clever reformulation. And so now I'll define a function for you, which is just the same counting problem. I just want to input it in a slightly different way. Uh, so it's going to be a function which I'll call uh, h of x, g, uh, which is the number of uh, coverings uh, c to p1, where the genus of c is equal to g, uh, such that, so I'm going to fix my two, ramifi two um, ramification conditions as being the positive parts and the negative parts of, um, uh, of this vector, okay? So, so this map is pi, so pi inverse, okay, I need to pick two points on p1, let me just pick zero and infinity. So pi inverse of zero is equal to x plus, pi inverse of, uh, okay, uh, infinity is equal to x minus. I'm being a little sloppy here. When I say is equal to, I mean that the profile that I see above infinity and above zero is x plus and x minus, okay? The only thing, it's the same counting problem. I haven't changed anything. The only difference is that I've made it in, I've, I've written the counting problem in such a way that the input is an integral vector in Zn with ha which has vanishing sum. Okay, that's the only thing I've done so far. Uh, yes, thank you. Okay, so, so this is the theorem. Uh, so the first, the first proof of it is by uh, Golden, Jackson, Vakil. This is uh, 2006, and then uh, the, the proof I'll talk about is due to Cavalieri, Mark Big, and Johnson, uh, 2008, um, and the, the the second proof goes quite a bit uh, quite a bit further and tells us uh, more. But let me just state the simplified version for now. Uh, so the function uh, h g of x from let me just say q uh, n zero, which is the vectors in q n with vanishing sum or r n zero, it doesn't matter. Say R n zero, the vectors in R n with vanishing sum, um, from uh, this thing to R uh, is a piecewise uh, polynomial function in X. Okay. So um, the way I've formulated it, I only defined hg of x for uh, integral values. But uh, okay, so the, so the real statement is that there exists a piecewise polynomial function. I'll come to exactly what I mean by that. But there exists a piecewise polynomial function such that on the integral points, right, on the integral points, hg of x agrees with this Hurwitz number count. Right? So let me, let me just stress that this is, this is not, there is, even to this day, and this theorem is 10 years old, 15 years old now, there's no really fantastic reason to believe why such a thing is true, right? I'm changing the ramification data. Why, why, should, why should changing the ramification data depend in a polynomial fashion or piecewise polynomial fashion? Ramif I'm only allowing ramification at two points, and somehow I get a, I get a polynomial uh, dependence. This is a somewhat striking, striking uh, is it result. For more no, it's actually not expected um, for more points. And in a in a particular sense, it's a little funny, but it's not expected for fewer points either. Uh, yeah, even for one point, in some sense, we don't expect polynomial dependency uh, because the yeah. It, let me let me not get into that. But somehow, it's it's something magical that's happening about uh, two pointed. Uh, and there's a lot of geometry in the background, but uh, but I would say this is still a. Is it construct? Oh, it's, it's the the polynomial is definitely not constructive. Um, but for, I'll I'll describe an algorithm uh, that would that is a fairly efficient way of uh, um, of computing these Hurwitz numbers. 
in a second. But it's definitely not, it's definitely not constructive. Uh, sorry, OK. So let me come back to this piecewise polynomiality, just because it might not be clear. So what do I mean by piecewise polynomiality? Well, the, so the domain of this is some vector space. So what I mean by piecewise polynomiality is that there's a finite collection of hyperplanes, and I can describe them if you'd like. So there's a finite collection of hyperplanes which divides my, uh, my, my domain into chambers, and inside each chamber, the function agrees with a polynomial. Okay? So inside over here, inside here, there's a polynomial. Polynomial P1 of x, maybe P2 of x. Uh, and when you... Uh, when you cross a wall, so when you cross one of these hyperplanes, uh, you, yeah, so this, this, this wall changing uh, P1 of x minus P2 of x uh, uh, has some explicit formulation as well. But, but this is what I mean by, by piecewise polynomial. Are there many functions? There exists a unique one. Unique. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so these chambers are sort of sufficiently large that, that um, uh, yeah, the polynomials are fully determined by the values inside the chamber. Yeah. Anyway, okay, so, so this, is, this is the geometry that I, that I, that I want to maybe uh, inform you of. So these chambers, are they actually cones? Uh, let's see, we should be able to figure that out. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So they're definitely polyhedral cones. I'm trying to figure out uh, if they're strongly convex, but but they're definitely polyhedral. Yeah. Yeah. So in fact, you can describe them explicitly. So you're looking at a collection of vectors where the sum is zero. So you get a hyperplane where um, any subset has some zero. Right. So I'm, if I'm adding 15 numbers together. If it so happens that one, three, five, and nine, or you know, the first, third, seventh, and ninth numbers all add up to zero, that would be uh, that would be a hyperplane here. So this is kind of resonance for that sum. Okay. So uh, I won't go into the details of, of of the proof of how one gets this uh, statement, but but the main step is the following kind of striking uh, striking result. So this is Cavalieri. Uh, Mark Vick Johnson, uh, they, they noticed something kind of uh, interesting. So, let me take a look at my notes for a second. So, let's say we are, so we have this counting problem. Okay, and this counting problem is, 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 the, is, is the size of some set, like all counting problems. Right? And, this, and the, the, the elements in that set are maps. Right? And they're maps that look like uh, you know, some genus 2, let's say in this case, some genus G, or in this case genus 2 uh, curve mapping down to P1, sorry, Riemann surface mapping down to P1, uh, where over um, 0 infinity, I have uh, you know, some fixed, um, Uh, sorry, I've, I've already changed notation. So let me say x minus and x plus. Okay. So when I look at the pre-image over infinity, I see the appropriate number of points that I expect. And, and when I look nearby, the number of sheets coming together is exactly that given by x plus or x minus if you're on the other side. Okay, so this is the set that I'm interested in. This is not the number of this set. And what they, they realized so, is that there was some kind of mysterious uh, bijection or way to count this uh, as instead of looking at covers of uh, P1 by looking at certain maps of graphs. Okay, so let me... I... Uh, okay, so I have to put the quotes either around the counting or the equals. No, the equals is fine. I have to tell you what counting means. It's not just the set theoretic count, but, okay. So, anyway, before I give you more details, this is just a flavor. So in, you know, 
if you want to create an icon for the folder that you're going to put all of this information in in your head, uh, the icon would be, instead of counting co maps from algebraic objects to other algebraic objects, we're counting maps from graphs to other graphs, or maybe from piecewise linear maps from, from something that looks like a graph to the real line. That's probably a better way to, to think about it. OK? So that's, that's kind of the, the very, very broad uh, perspective. And this is an example of, of what people now refer to as tropicalization. Okay, so this is, this is what people would refer to as a, as a tropical correspondence uh, principle. Okay, so, so a couple of years before this, maybe in 2004 or 2005, um, uh, Grisha Michalkin, based on suggestions of Kinsevich, gave a, a similar bijection between not maps from curves to P1, but maps from curves to P2, and counted those in terms of certain graphs mapped, mapping to R2, and, and this was kind of a, a, a striking result at the time. Still, you can argue. Um, and then a couple of years later, uh, Cavalieri, Johnson, and Mark Vig noticed that actually the simpler version of maps to to just P1 also seem to exhibit this property. So something systematic seemed to be going on. OK. OK, so what are the objects on the right? OK, so the objects on the right are the following. Uh, so let me give this a name. I'll call it capital gamma. This is mapping to the real line. OK, so what is gamma? So gamma is. Uh, trivalent uh, graph. Uh, I want gamma to be equipped with a metric. A metric on a graph is just a, length, a notion of how long each, each um, edge is. Okay? So when I look at this graph, I want to be able to tell that this has length pi, and this has length e, and this has length in you know, infinity if it goes out all the way. and uh, Maybe this has length, whatever you want. Okay, I just want I want that data. It's just a real number attached to each each edge. So, okay, so, so gamma is trivalent graph. It's a, it's equipped with a metric. Um, uh, the map pi t is piecewise linear, and in particular, it's linear on each edge. E and gamma. Okay, so meaning when I look at this map, and I just restrict it to this edge, that's actually a linear map. It's, given, it's, it's, it's just given by some, uh, by some slope. Um, and in fact, I want that slope to be integral with integral slope. OK? So, uh, so it's trivalent. Ah, and of course. I'll say gamma has genus uh, two, by which I mean just the first Betty number of the graph as a topological space uh, is two, right? One, two. Uh, e, is it e minus v plus one is equal to two? Yeah, e minus v plus one should be two. Okay, so it's trivalent graph. It's equipped with this notion of length. Uh, it's piecewise linear with integral slope on every edge. OK, that's good. It's mapping to R, and it's piecewise linear. Ah, so there's a third condition, which is that it's uh, balanced. OK, so balanced, let me, let, me, let me define it by drawing it. So on, this, on each one of the edges, I'm going to draw a number. And that number, I'll put in a box. And when I, when I put a number in a box, that means the slope. OK, so let's say. Slope one on this edge, slope two on this edge, slope three on this edge. And so the balancing condition is a zero tension condition. So, so when, I, when I have these two, basically water is flowing along the graph, and I need to preserve volume. Okay? So one plus two is three, so the slope along this has to be three. Three plus three is six, so the slope along this has to be six. Uh, six can split into some way, maybe two and four. It has to rejoin to, to become six because the water doesn't leak anywhere. And then maybe this becomes one again. And this becomes five. And this becomes three and two. And this becomes five. OK? Not so hard to do, right? 
Okay, so balanced is, uh, let's call it volume preserved from left to right. And finally, uh, there should be a finally, right, right, ramification over what I'll say plus infinity and minus infinity is given by, uh, what do I want to call it? Oh, given by uh, x plus, sorry, uh, x, yeah, x plus and x minus. Okay? Yeah, yeah, just the stretching factor. So if the edges weight uh, 3 and uh, slope 6, then it would map onto a thing of edge 18. 18, exactly. Yeah, by weight you mean length, yes. Yeah, so if I have a length length 3 edge and, and yeah, if this is length 3, then its image is length 18. Yeah. Right? So it, it's, uh, it's fully determining the map and its uh, slopes actually fully determines the lengths on, on the top by the lengths on the bottom. Uh, and then ramification over zero and over, over plus infinity and minus infinity to match the ramification over zero and infinity on this side. Okay, so I'm not, I shouldn't even, uh, I, I shouldn't even really have to, I should make you guess, but I won't, because it's uh, four o'clock or something. Uh, so minus infinity is this direction. When I look above this, I see a bunch of edges, right? If I go far enough to the left, I see a bunch of edges mapping down, right? And those bunch of edges map down with certain slopes, 3, 2, 1, or 1, 5. And that naturally gives me a partition of the degree. Okay. And the degree being, OK, this is a map of, of degree 6. OK. So balance is that it's constant. Yes, yes, exactly. Balancing is that the degree is constant, no matter which point I choose, provided I weight things correctly. Uh, yeah, great. OK, so that's a long definition. But it's not actually so hard, right? So you could basically come up with it on your own. You know the genus of the source. You know the, 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 the target is, is the real numbers. I've told you that it has to be piecewise linear. I've told you maybe one magical condition, that, which is that it's balanced, and everything else you could probably guess. The balancing is something that comes out of algebraic geometry. It comes out of this uh, studying these objects uh, somewhat carefully, which I may get to. But um, OK. It's a, it's a reasonable set, right? You could, you could come up with this. And you know, just from the fact that I was able to do this on the board, which I'm usually quite bad at, uh, should convince you that it's actually not so hard to do in general. OK. And now, final, uh, finally, finally, I should describe what counting means. So for every single one of these objects, I'm not actually just going to count them with one. I'm going to count them with some weight. OK? So this is a weighted count. Uh, and the weighted count, uh, so the, the, the weight of a cover from a graph to the real numbers. If I'm given one of these, if you happen to have one of these, um, then the weight of the cover is the product of the expansion factors of bounded edges. OK. Product of expansion factor with bounded edges. OK, so these, the, this, this, and this are not bounded. They go off to infinity right, by the balancing condition. This is bounded, so 3 times 6 times 2 times 4 times 6 times 5 times 3 times 2. And I can't do that in my head, so you'll have to trust me that it works out. It's a number. Product is a number. Okay. So that's what a tropical correspondence theorem looks like. Okay, so so the the proof that Cavalieri, Johnson, and Markvig, see, oh sorry, Cavalieri, Johnson, and Markvig uh, write down is a, is a proof via representation theory. Okay, so what they managed to do is encode the factorization process. You know, if you literally sat down to factorize the identity in the symmetric group into given cycle types, they literally were able to write down that factorization process in a graphical way. Right? So they were able to do that, and, and ultimately, they just algorithmized that, and then later on noticed that, hey, look, I can, I can encode this as a map of graphs. Okay, so it was clear at that point, 10 years ago, that there should be some intrinsic geometric meaning to these graphs. Right? These graphs should not just come as combinatorial objects that encode a factorization algorithm, but you know, it's not a coincidence that 
you know, I'm, I'm counting maps of, of complex dimension one manifolds. The, the resulting objects that I'm counting here look, as, look, look like piecewise linear maps of graphs. This has genus two, that has genus two, this has degree six, this has degree six. So it's in some fairly sophisticated way in which this algorithm is actually encoding the, the, the geometry of these objects. Okay. And, you know, just to put this in a little bit of context, around the time that uh, certainly when I, when, when I myself started getting interested in this problem, we had multiple proofs of this sort. Multiple proofs that said, oh, the number of graphs in this context is equal to the number of algebraic curves in this context, and if you squinted at them, they kind of looked very similar. Uh, but, but, um, I think we were lacking a really um, compelling geometric understanding of this. Uh, okay. Ah, yes, so thank you. Thank you for the question. I would have almost forgotten. Um, so yeah, let me, let me redraw one of these graphs, okay? So let's think about what the polynomiality property actually does, right? So, so let's pretend I don't know what the incoming slopes are, right? So maybe this is uh, maybe this is x, maybe this uh, yeah, maybe this is x1, maybe this is uh, uh, you know, x1 uh, minus x2, maybe this is x2, maybe this is you know some. You just keep going like that, right? The weight of this is is clearly a polynomial in these internal edges. It's clearly a polynomial in, in the, the, right, so maybe this is, yeah, so this is again x1 minus x2. Uh, I should have drawn more about, maybe, no, okay. It is what it is. So the, the weight of this is a product over these xi's, but the xi's are the incoming and outgoing entries. Right? And so you can imagine that if you change, right, if I can draw this shape without knowing what the x1's are, all I'm, all I'm really um, counting is for each graph, I have some polynomial, right? A product over these xi's, that's all. For each, for each graph, I'm counting whether, I'm, I'm, I'm counting the product of these as being uh, the, poly, the polynomial contribution. Now, why would it change when you went from one chamber to another? Well, it, would cha it could change because some of the graphs you're drawing are not valid and they need to be replaced with other graphs. If you had a really, if you had a small subset of things summing to zero, then, okay, this, this takes a little bit of work and I probably shouldn't do it on the board, but, but it turns out that if you have a, a, a smaller subset of, of entries summing to zero, the types of graphs that you get to draw change. Certain graphs will become invalid because the incoming slope here will become zero, and certain graphs will become uh, out valid because, um, uh, because they, they used to be zero, but now they're not. Right? And so as the shapes of the graphs are changing in the chambers, you get different polynomial contributions. And this also tells you how to detect, when you go from one wall to the next wall, how the, po how the polynomial changes, right? Because you just need to figure out which graphs you weren't allowed to draw before and which graphs you are allowed to draw before. So this wall crossing structure was really the big achievement of, of Cavalieri, Johnson, so and, and Mark Big. Some over valid graphs of this. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Yeah. So, in, uh, so that's at least, you know, the, the, in many cases, that's just that o these observations are enough to just power through the proof. Uh, in full generality, you need some Erhard theory. It turns out that these are uh, the number of lattice points in an appropriate polytope that are defined by inequalities involving the xi's. Okay, so it's a it's a really great uh, it's a really great result. Um, so one, so sorry. Sorry. Yes, it's all combinatorial. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and in some sense, what we're trying to do is put the geometry back in the, in the combinatorics and figure out where it's coming from. Okay, so, so rather than, than go more into piecewise polynomiality, just to label it, uh, I, want to, I want to go in, in a different direction, which is explain where this combinatorics is arising from in general. Uh, is that a time? Uh, great. Okay, so... So how does one get from an algebraic curve to a graph? This is a, this is a decent question. Um, the, the standard approach 
and this is what one, one tries to make precise, is via what we call degeneration. So degeneration is the idea that rather than studying a single object, a single geometric object, you put that, you, you vary the coefficients of the defining equations, and then take some limit as that variation goes to zero or infinity. And then something happens to your geometric object in the limit, perhaps it breaks, okay? And once it breaks, maybe it becomes sufficiently simple that you can replace it with combinatorics. So let me, let me just give you an example to start with. Okay, so, so let, um, uh, let me take f sub four, uh, which is, it's going to be a polynomial in uh, x, y, and z, homogeneous of, of degree four, hence the four. Okay, and what I want to do is take f sub four, and I, this is just a single polynomial. What I actually want to do is create a whole family of polynomials. So I'm going to take f sub four, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to take f sub four plus uh, x times y times z times x plus y plus z. Okay. So when I choose this f sub four, I really need to choose it to be sufficiently general. Okay. So I don't want too many of the coefficients of the monomials to be zero, and I don't want too many relations between them, but uh, so this is just, I, to, to be technical about it, what I want is for the vanishing locus of f sub four to be a smooth curve, okay, a smooth quartic curve. Uh, okay, but whatever, it doesn't really matter. So homogeneous polynomial defines, has a well-defined zero locus inside projective space of dimension two. And so for each, uh, for each value of t, I get uh, a, a well-defined algebraic curve a Riemann surface inside projective space of dimension two. Okay, and now I can let t vary. Uh, actually, I should be, sorry, I apologize for this. Let me just renormalize it so that I'm doing t times f sub four so that I can send t to zero instead of infinity. Okay, so as, uh, so, okay. so when t is non-zero, uh, the vanishing locus of this thing that I just uh, just drew is some uh, some quartic curve inside in, inside the projective plane. This is a cartoon version of it, uh, right? If I draw a line, it hits it at four points. Great. So that's a quartic curve. Um, but the vanishing locus of um, okay, so this is at t not equal to zero. When t equal to zero, the, the vanishing locus of this equation is actually kind of dumb because it doesn't matter what this is, right? It's just the vanishing locus of a product of a bunch of linear terms, right? So this is the, this is the, you know, the vanishing locus of, locus of x is the yz plane projected onto P2, the xz plane projected onto P2, the xy plane projected onto P2, so those three are lines, and x plus y plus z is obviously a line as well. And so if you look in P2 at what it would, you know, you can, you can, this you can actually do with a, with, a, with, a, with a computer. It'll have one line like that, one line like that, one line like that, and then another line if I'm skilled enough to intersect all three. There we go. Yeah, one line to rule them all. Um, okay, so, so these are my four lines inside P2. So I started off with a quartic curve and I ended up with, with four lines inside P2 by kind of just juggling the equations a little bit by T uh, until, until kind of all the, uh, until something happened. So what was it that happened here? The thing that happened was that the geometry vanished, right? Lines have no real geometry. If I draw a quartic curve in P2, right? If you look at the complex solutions to that, that's quite complicated. A quartic curve in P2 has, uh, as uh, genus three. So it would, even as a topological surface, it would look like this. Is that right? D minus one choose two, yes. Okay, so it, even a, just as a topolo it's, its topological structure looks like this. But as a line is something, you know, it's just a, it's just a sphere. Complex points are just a sphere over the real numbers, is, it's a line. So there's no, the idea is that there's no geometry left here, that there's no geometry left in the components. What is interesting, however, is the fact that those components come together in non-trivial ways. Okay, so what one forms from this is this graph, which is called the dual graph of 
uh, v t equals 0, this thing, right? And what I'm going to do, so the reason it's called dual, is because I'm, I'm kind of going to reverse the dimensions. Every time I see a component here, I'm going to put a vertex down. And every time two components meet, I'm going to draw an edge between them. Okay, so in this case, there are four components. And each one, it, well, these are lines in, in P2, so all of them meet. Okay. K4. Good. Right. So the, the basic principle of tropical geometry is that the objects like this, they can't capture everything about the vanishing locus of this, but they often capture quite a lot. Okay. And just again, stress, stress the kinds of analogies that, uh, that, that one likes to make in the subject. Let me call this graph gamma. The first bedding number of gamma, once again, is three, right? Six minus four plus one is probably three. So, so this process is remembering some, uh, some information, which is, again, reflective of, of, the, uh, of the remembering of information that is happening when one translates from, from curves to graphs. Okay, so, so now the general version. It's not, not so, so dissimilar. Yes. Uh, yeah, and you could choose any general four lines, and it would be it would be fine. Yeah, but also four lines in P two. Uh, just like three points in P two, you can find a matrix that that gets any four lines to those. So up to a change of coordinates, I think it's okay. Okay, so. That tells us kind of how to degenerate curves. Okay. So kind of step one in this program is degenerate curves to graphs. And step two is, is to take to, in fact, rip, yeah, OK. So, rip, so degenerate your curve to. Maybe I should say this better to a union of P1. Right. So basically, in, in, in this particular case, it just amounts to uh, taking your equation and, 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 and kind of deforming it until it's just a product of linear forms. Uh, and then take the dual graph. Um, and so then you, then you prove a, a, a theorem. So this is um, the, a, a, a serious amount of input into this is, is an old paper of, uh, paper of Harrison Mumford. Um, but then you need to extract some uh, combinatorics from it, uh, which my co-authors and I dug through. Um, which is the fact that not only can you, so when you're given, um, when you're given a cover, not only can you degenerate each curve individually, not only can you move each curve, indiv defining equations of each curve individually to make it into a graph. In fact, you can do, the, do it simultaneously in such a way. Okay, so degenerate. in such a way that um, uh, 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 cover of curves, cover of uh, Riemann surfaces, algebraic curves, um, gives rise to a map of graphs. So that tells you that there is some way to go from you know, the set of all covers of curves, of a fixed curve maybe, with fixed ramification data. Uh, 
Oh, it's basically what I was drawing earlier. Yeah, piecewise linear map uh, that is balanced and, uh, yeah, balanced piecewise linear map is sufficient with, if you, uh, and then it's a consequence of this that all of that extra stuff that I said has to happen, like keeping track of the discrete data comes for free. Okay, so that tells you that there's somehow a map, not just from curves to graphs, but from covers of a curve. Okay, maybe I should do it like this. So from map C to P1 with specified ramification to the set of maps gamma to R with specified ramification, and so this this map is called the tropicalization uh, map. So there exists some, there exists some map like this. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, just like in the curve case, uh, okay, yes. Uh, well, I don't know what a cover of graphs is. I could, I, okay, I'll, I'll say cover of graphs, but then you have to take the definition to be exactly what I told you before. But what you do get for free is a piecewise linear map that you then show it covers everything that you want. Okay, um, so, so that tells you at least that there's some map. Every time you have, uh, you know, a family of, uh, of, of covers of curves, you get a, fa you get a, a particular map of graphs, right? So in, in, in the case of that complete graph example, K4, we really needed the whole family in order to get this, uh, this, 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 this graph at the end of the day. So really what we get is that families of covers of curves uh, go to, go to particular, uh, particular graphs. Okay. Uh, I'm rapidly running out of time. So um, how shall I... How should I? How should I continue? Okay, so let me let me do it this way. So that on its own is is somehow, at least, um, it gives us some sense that the that that this uh, that a result like this uh, might hold. But to actually um, set up a reasonable correspondence, including you know understanding the multiplicities um, uh, on the graph theoretic side is coming from geometry in some way. One needs to go a little bit a uh, little bit further. Okay, so let me explain. Uh, exactly how. So um, this, will be, this will be rapid. Uh, okay, so, so let uh, hg uh, x be the space of all covers of P1, now allowing the branch points to move. So earlier, right, right in the beginning, I said you have to fix the location of the branch points. Now I, would don't, I want to relax that condition. If you fix the locations of the branch points, then it turns out that you just get a finite set, right? Because there are finitely many covers. But if I allow the branch points to move, then it turns out that the resulting set, which is now infinite, has some interesting geometry. Okay, so this is a fact that this, this you know, what I've just described as a set for you is actually is a complex manifold. So algebraic variety, smooth algebraic variety in this case. Okay, so that's that's a fact. So once one knows this kind of start trying to look for the same thing on the graph theoretic side. So similarly, you have a, some sort of proposition, which is that, that genus G covers of the real line with fixed uh, ramification uh, index X, where the uh, images of trivalent vertices are allowed to move, okay? So I didn't mention this earlier. 
in order to actually get a finite count on the graph theoretic, theoretic side, you shouldn't allow the map to change in continuous fashion. You want a finite set. So I'm actually, earlier I was actually fixing the images of those trivalent, um, uh, trivalent um, vertices, just like here I'm fixing the images of the branch points. But if I allow it to move, um, okay, uh, is uh, what I'll call a polyhedral complex. Okay, so a polyhedral complex is, is not a scary object at all. It's just like a simplicial complex. Right? So if you took a simplicial complex and you took a cone over it, you get a polyhedral complex. So let's just let me draw. Uh, it might look something like this. Right? So maybe it has a cone like this, and maybe it has another cone like this. And maybe it has another cone like this, and another cone like this. Right? It looks something like that. This is inside R2. That's how I want you to picture this. So, so, it, so this, this, this set, this infinite set of graphs, just like this infinite set of algebraic curves, a priori, you don't expect it to have any kind of structure to continuously move from one to the other, but it turns out that you can actually build a, what I would call a moduli space, a parameter space for uh, this set of graphs. Okay? So the set of graphs actually forms some interesting topological space on its own, and this is some, uh, this is some, complex, uh, some complex manifold. Okay, and then, okay, <laughs> since I'm basically out of time, let me tell you the, the, the false version of the theorem because I need to leave something out drastically. Uh, but there is a continuous uh, and functorial, but ignore that if you don't know what I mean by it. Uh, there's a continuous and functorial a uh, map that takes the set of all algebraic uh, covers of P1 uh, to the set of all, uh, oh sorry, I should fix this X, to the set of all uh, tropical covers, the set of all graph theoretic covers, uh, and with uh, an inclusion in the other direction. Okay? And in fact, one can say more, this map is actually a deformation retraction. Okay? So as far as the topo a huge piece of the topology of HGP1X is actually visible on this side. Okay? This, this map is a, is a deformation retraction. It's not actually true on the nose. One needs to add a, a, a technical thing here, uh, which is you need to pass to an associated analytic space, but that's actually quite a, that's quite a, quite a bit of work. So, okay, the, the, so that's why I've said false over here. The truth is that there's an associated analytic space which, which, in, which has all of the data of this complex manifold, but there's some, some, one needs to do something first and then you get a continuous projection map from, um, from, the, from the set of all algebraic curves uh, to the set of all graphs. And so these multiplicities are coming because it is possible, these maps are sufficiently explicit, it is possible to look at a point here a graph that you know that you're counting and look at the pre-image and actually just compute how many there are. And the, the, the common torics is sufficiently explicit that you can write down, an, write down a formula for that. And when you write down a formula for that, you t end up getting this product over, uh, over edge weights. <laughs> okay, so um, unfortunately I'm out of time, but I'm happy to talk later and uh, thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Of Horowitz theorem. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so the statement is that, um, okay, so the, the, the question, okay, the question was just to restate it, right? So, uh, so the statement is the following. Um, I'm going to fix a bunch of discrete data. So the, I, I'm going to fix a P1, the genus of my source curve, the ramification data, so when the map gets ramified, I want to fix the combinatorial structure of the pre-image. So are you fixing number of branch And the fixing, so the number of branch points is fixed once I fix the genus and the ramification and all of that. That's I mean. And you're also fixing the location of the branch points. So if you take a curve, for example. Yeah, there's 2G, there's 2G plus 2 branch points. But why is there a finite number? I'm fixing the location of the branch point. In fact, in the hyperelliptic case, there's a unique one. 
Right? So once I fix the location of the branch points on the base, then I uniquely get a hyperelliptic cover of it. And if you allow the if you allow it to vary, then you get a two G plus two dimensional space, two G two G minus one dimensional space. All your branch points. Yes. I was thinking you were fixing the. I mean. No, no. The, sorry. The. You were fixing the branching data. Yeah. So I'm fixing the branching data and the location of the branch point on the base. Okay. Yes. Can you just explain this? Uh, in the yeah. I was just wondering, uh, what do you mean by an analytic space? Yeah. Okay. So, so this is an analytic space in the sense of, of Berkovich. So, so this is the Berkovich analyticization of of, um, of X. So the, the basic uh, the basic idea is that. Um, what I start off with is an algebraic variety over the complex numbers, and what I want to do is probe that algebraic variety by little analytic disks. Okay, so an analytic disk in algebraic geometry is modeled by the spec of evaluation ring, spectrum of evaluation ring, and so what I want to do is is kind of probe the geometry of my space by maps from spectra of evaluation rings into X. So all such maps can be assembled to form a topological space. That is that has one of, that's housed off and path connected and all of these things that algebraic varieties are not, and so this topological space can be fibered over a polyhedral space. So that's the precise statement. Okay. But uh, Berkovich's theory is is quite technical. Sure. Better not to get into it. Yeah. So they are the. Um, uh, Oh, the dimension of the fiber. Okay, so that's again kind of getting into the weeds of, of Berkovich's theory. Um, let me see if I can explain it well. Um, before, before I can answer what the dimension of the fiber is, I should, I should answer a better question, or a, a, diff, a, really, a worse question, which is what is the fiber? As in, what does it look like? So this is just a topological continuous map. Right? So the fiber actually ends up being an analytic domain. Right? It's not an algebraic variety. It's actually an analytic domain. It looks something like, a, like, a, like an analytic ball, a poly, a poly disk inside CN, but a version inside Berkovich's theory. So the pre-image of a point is what we call an affinoid domain. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, you should think of, of an analog of a disk in higher dimensions. So, and, and what is that saying? Uh, it's saying that if I look at all of the algebraic curves over one parameter, that are parameterized by a, by a one-dimensional base, if I look at all of the ones that can be tropicalized to a fixed graph, a fixed cover of graphs, then that actually forms a ball. That actually forms a disk. Yeah, so, yeah, and, and, and it has full dimension. As an analytic space, it has, it has full dimension uh, in this space. Yes. 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 Yeah. Um, I would say yes now. Um, so, um, so after we finished this paper, so, okay. So, so the, there were broadly kind of two different directions in which the theory went, and one was to um, so one was to increase the dimension of the target. Uh, so basically, what we understood early on was genus zero curves mapping into P2. And there was one direction which was to increase the genus, and eventually you get something like this, but then you, you have to keep the dimension of the target as either one or two. And then on the other side, you could increase the dimension, but you have to keep the genus the same. And so for, those, for all of those situations, you can find statements like this. Uh, and there is now a unified proof that, in, a sense, in essence, that was the content of my thesis, uh, to give kind of a unified proof of all of these uh, all of these methods, um, but uh, but yeah, it's it's kind of interesting. The, the different you know in, in this case the original proofs were via representation theory. In the two dimensional case, the original proofs are actually via symplectic geometry and real real algebraic geometry, where you literally. Uh, so another way in which you can get a graph from a Riemann surface is by taking a a pair of pants decomposition of the surface, 
and then replacing every pair of pants with the trivalent vertex and every uh, tube, every annulus with an edge, and then you kind of stick all of them together just as the pair of pants would dictate you to, and then you get a, 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 a curve this way. So, so using that perspective, Mikalkin proved the two-dimensional case, but all of that has been redone essentially using these techniques. Uh, yeah, it's, it's basically turned out to be that way. So, so it's hard to answer what is tropicalization in a precise sense. It's more just a collection of techniques that have a similar flavor. Uh, yeah. It's, sorry? Discretization. Yeah, something like discretization. So another way to think about it that, uh, that, that I, I, I sometimes hear people say is uh, somehow dequantization. So, so you think of quantization as taking a problem that you have and adding information that disappears when you take a limit, whereas this is assuming that, you're, that you're, the actual reality of algebraic geometry or the complexity of algebraic geometry is itself quantized, so it maybe depends on some parameter t, and so you, when you send that t to zero, maybe you get some uh, reduction of the theory. So, so this is kind of a dequantization, uh, and there are other, yeah, there are tons of other ways to, to see it. Um, the name tropical is because there was earlier the notion of a tropical semi-ring, which is, um, uh, which is essentially um, the real numbers with plus replaced by min and times replaced by plus, something like a logarithm. And so when you try and push forward geometry through this uh, change of operations, uh, you end up with piecewise linear objects. So yeah. this tropicalization is not the same as that? that it's all related. It's all, yeah, it's all, it's all related. Uh, but if you ask me to give, give a precise statement, I'll, 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 uh, I'll fail, so. Sorry? No, I don't, I don't think so. It's, it's more, we, I, I think we've just been, yeah, we've basically been going with the, you know, uh, person on the street definition of tropicalization. You know, you show your result to somebody on the street and they say, yeah, that looks pretty tropical, then you, then you call it tropical. We're very inclusive. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's a computer scientist who lived in Brazil, and I believe he lived not in the tropics, but worked in the tropics because he's, you know, Brazil is kind of exactly there. So whether, whether or not it should be called tropical geometry ultimately comes down to whether or not he worked more at home or at the office. So anyway, yeah. Further questions? <laughs> Thanks.